Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. This is uh, Thursday, December 7th, 2023. And this is in America, we designated December 7th as Pearl Harbor Day. This is the 82nd anniversary of the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. I don't think there's any Pearl Harbor veterans who were there that day that are still living. There might be one or two. Uh, but we thank all of our veterans uh, for their service to our country, uh, particularly from the World War II generation. And there are very few of them left now. They would all be uh, into their 90s, maybe a few in their late 80s, uh, who defeated the Nazis and defeated the, uh, the Japanese uh, during the war. And that was the Second World War. And my grandmother always thought there was a Third World War yet to come. And who knows? We'll see if she was right about that. In the meantime, hit the subscribe bar and then the notification bell so you can be notified whenever content's added to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. Thank you to the new people who subscribe to the channel. I appreciate that. Uh, can't grow the channel without the help of my loyal viewers such as yourself. And today will be, as you can see, uh, Leviticus 25 and 6 and Romans chapter 7 and 8. And so... Let me, I'm still playing with which of the uh, video platforms I want to use, so I might switch back to the other one, but I kind of like being out where I can be seen, so that's why I use this one. Okay, so we are looking here, the Sabbath of the seventh year in uh, uh, Leviticus 25, where God is giving them some uh sort of rules of procedure for the Levitical priesthood and some of their celebrations. And, and the Sabbath year, the seventh year, uh, this was, a, I kind of wish we would do some, some of these things today. I think it would help us as a society. And there's some uh, interesting uh, tidbits in here about farming and care of the land that we'll see uh, as well. So uh, Leviticus chapter 25, if you want to open your Bibles or your Bible app, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard, what grows of its own accord of, uh, of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for, for you, your male and female servants, your hired man, and the stranger who dwells with you. For your livestock and the beasts in the field and all its produce shall be food." And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves, seven times seven, and the time of the seventh Sabbath of years shall be to you forty-nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound in the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim uh, liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. This is why a 50th wedding anniversary uh, is uh, or considered a jubilee anniversary uh, when Queen Elizabeth had her 50th year on the throne. Uh, so when Queen Elizabeth had her uh, 50th anniversary on the throne, that was considered her year of jubilee. Uh, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession. Each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee to you, and it shall be neither sow nor reap what grows in its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your unintended or untended vine. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his return to his possessions. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's land, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor according to the number of years of crops that he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price, and according to the fewer numbers of years, you shall diminish its price. 
for he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Therefore you shall not oppress one another, uh, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord your God. Now the year of Jubilee, uh, every seven years the land was to be uh, given a Sabbath rest. Uh, left the fields alone. Now today, there's even, I'm told, I'm not a farmer, but farmers will, they call it rotating the crops or rotating the land. So they'll grow the corn or wheat or whatever on the east side, let's just say, for so many years, and then they'll move it around to the south and they'll uh, leave that plot of land that they had been uh, farming alone for a year or so and let the soil rest. And then they'll just keep rotating. Um, and that comes from this uh, passage here in the Bible. Uh, and then uh, every 50 years was the year of Jubilee. And uh, and with the year of Jubilee, if I bought land from you at the year of Jubilee, I had to return that land to you. If I owed you money, uh, you would have to forgive the loan. And this is not the same thing. As I, I, I hear this with student loan forgiveness, uh, which is really just transferring from the borrower to the taxpayer is what it is. This, that's not the same thing as what we're talking about here. If I loaned you money, just say $10,000 to try and keep it all simple. When the year of Jubilee rolled around, if you still owed me any balance on that loan, I had to forgive it, meaning I ate it. So if I loaned you $10,000 and come the year of Jubilee, you owe me $2,000 still. You know, that's my tough luck. I could not take it. Uh, to the city council or, or to the priest or, or someone and say, here, you know, Joe Schmo borrowed this money from me. Uh, you pay me what, what's owed. No, that's just the way it goes. Another question once came up is what would happen if a uh, structure was built on land uh, and it came to the year of Jubilee? Who would uh, have it? Well, and I put this to a rabbi who in turn put it to some other rabbis and they said, well, first of all, you wouldn't want to build on a piece of land knowing it's going to revert back to its original owner. Point taken. Secondly is if I had bought the land from you and now I've got to return it or, uh, uh, to you and I build a house on it, let's say, it, it, theoretically you should compensate me for it, but there would be no obligation to compensate me for it. So you could end up with a free house or a barn or whatever I built on it. Okay, and then we uh, look on here, uh, verse 18. So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them. You will dwell in the land uh, in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year since we shall not sow or gather in our produce? Then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it will bring forth produce enough for three years. And you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce until the ninth year, until its produce comes in. Then you shall eat of the old harvest. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem it that uh, what his brother sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him uh, count the years since its sale and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. But if he is not able to have it restored to him, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his possession." If a man sells a house in a walled city that he may redeem it with a whole year, uh, within a whole year after it is sold, within a full year he may redeem it. But if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it. Throughout his generations it shall not be released in the Jubilee. However, the houses of villages which have no wall around them shall be counted as the fields uh, of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall be released in the Jubilee. Nevertheless, the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possessions, the Levites may redeem at any time. Remember, the Levites didn't get a land um, inheritance. And if a man uh, the, the, that the tribes got, 
And if a man purchases a house from the Levites, then the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall be released in the Jubilee, for the houses of the city of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the common land of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or sojourner, that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him. Now you got to look at the pronouns here. Who's the him? Okay, the Hebrew could not charge interest. That's what usury is actually in modern American law. Usury is defined as excessive interest. And that can get to be a little bit subjective, but um, typically if the prime rate is, say, 5%, I don't know what it is, that's what the best customers get charged, and then the not-so-good customers would be charged more. So you could go you know, maybe up to 10%, I guess, uh, without having to worry about usury. Uh, credit cards and unsecured loans typically have high interest rates on them, but anyway. Uh, in this case, it's she's talking about interest, just regular interest. Uh, so you shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food for, at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Now, my, uh, what generally the take on this is that a Hebrew could charge interest to somebody who wasn't a Hebrew. Yeah, he just couldn't charge interest to his own people. So here again, when you see... The loan forgiveness crowd running around wanting uh, taxpayers to assume their responsibility um, and they bring up the whole idea of interest they're not playing the whole telling the whole story uh, interest could not be charged to hebrew so it is permissible today to charge interest you're not in violation of any biblical commandment or anything okay and this is a big one to a lot of folks, the law concerning slavery. And if one of your brethren who dwells with you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be to you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall depart from you, he and his children, and with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his father's. For they are my servants whom I brought up out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. And as for your male and female slaves whom you may have from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, now here you can see some privilege. There were certain privileges granted or rights, whatever you want to call it, granted to the Hebrews that didn't exist always for the sojourner or the foreigner or the ones captured in battle, or anything like that. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you, and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children, after you to inherit them as possessions. They shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. Now, if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you, or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncles, or his uncle's son may redeem him, or anyone who is near of kin to him and his family may redeem him, or if he is uh, able, he may redeem himself. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. It shall be according to the time of a hired servant for him. If there are still many years remaining according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money with which he was bought. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years he shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are servants to me, they are my servants whom I brought up out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God." So there are some rules here about slavery, yes. 
And you notice some of this is what we would call indentured servitude. This is people selling themselves into slavery. And slavery as we know it in, in America and Europe in the Middle Ages and coming up through the 1800s is not an apples to apples comparison to compare it to biblical times. Uh, what we have is chattel slavery, which was uh, 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 Exodus, I believe, 2316, I believe it is. It says that if a man kidnaps another man and then sells him, uh, he shall be put to death. So chattel slavery was not something God approved of. And slavery also in Old Testament times, many times was, you know, the Babylonians come in and conquer, <clears throat> excuse me, conquer the land and enslave the people. So it was more of a military, I'm stronger than you, I have a bigger army than you, so I'm going to conquer you and enslave you. That's basically what it was. It wasn't the chattel race-based slavery that we know of in our nation. So it's, it's, an, it's not apples to apples to compare the two. Okay, chapter 26. You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar, shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone on your land to bow down to it. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now, does this mean we can't do statues and, and have pictures of Jesus today? I don't believe so. I don't think, I think this is uh, making a graven image. That is an image that you are making for worship to just make a statue of a war hero or even make what you believe Jesus to look like. We don't even know what he looked like. I don't believe it's a violation of the commandment because I'm not putting the picture up there and then worshiping it. I'm putting it up maybe more for decorative or just to let people know I'm a Christian. Um, it, it's not quite the same as what we're talking about here. Verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season the land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last until the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace to the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. Verse 9. For I will look on you favorably, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat of the old harvest, and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. But if you do not obey me, and do not deserve all these commandments, or do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemy shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeating or defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. Verse 18, and after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be uh, spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall trees of the land yield their fruit. I'd really like to have some of the people who uh, advocate the loosening of sin standard, uh, standards of sin have a look at what God did in the Old Testament and see, do you really think we're going to escape judgment? Uh, of course, a lot of those people don't believe the Bible, so it'd probably be a waste of time anyway. Uh, verse 21, Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, 
Then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you with seven times uh, for your sins, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant when you are gathered together within your cities. I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy, that when I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall, shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I will chase, chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. Let me get the idea he means business here. He's not playing around. Verse 31, I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. And as for those who are left, I will send faintness into their hearts. In the lands of their enemies, the sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. They shall flee as though fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. They shall stumble over one another as it were before a sword when no one pursues, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies, and you shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. Verse 39, And those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, also in their fathers' iniquities which are with them, they shall waste away. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, I will remember. I will remember the land, the land also shall be left empty by them, and will also its Sabbaths, will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despise my judgments and because of their souls abhor my statutes. Yet for all that, when, uh, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them, to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God, but, it, but for their sake I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land from Egypt in the sight of the nations, I might, that I might be their God. I am the Lord." These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord Himself made between, which the Lord made between Himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Romans chapter seven. Now you can tell by it starts with a conjunction, or do you not know, brother? And so really, this should be in context with chapter six, uh, where he had uh, uh, talked about. You now let's pull it down here. Uh, talked about moving, uh, being dead to sin, coming down here at the end of the chapter, moving from slaves or servants of sin to being servants of God. And it ends up by saying, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we come into chapter 7, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law is dominion over man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. And if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no uh, adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who has raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So, we can't have two covenants in effect. 
This is why the, the Christians are God's people now, not the Jews, because we've got a new covenant. That covenant was done away with. It was nailed to the cross. And because of that covenant being done away with, we have a new covenant. So we've that that husband, so to speak, has died, and we've got a new husband. That's the Christian, uh, uh, the Christian faith, the uh, the new covenant, the New Testament. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to uh, what we were held by so that we should serve in newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good, so that the sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand, for what I will do that I do not practice. But what I hate that I do, if then I do what I will not to do, what I will or what I don't want, what he doesn't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not, uh, to do it is no longer I who do it but sin that dwells in me I find then a law that evil is present in me the one uh, who wills to do good for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind bringing me into captivity the law of sin which is in my members O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So basically, Paul, and to sum it all up, tie it up in a nice, neat little package, he had the same struggle with sin that any of us have. Uh, now, as to whether he's got a specific sin here, or just sin in general, I'm not real sure. But uh, we know he had a thorn in the flesh. Exactly what that was, we don't know. But he struggled just like we do. See, the Bible characters we read about were not superhuman. They didn't have S's tattooed on their, on their chest or on their uh, uh, clothing that they wore with capes flying. They were regular people. They were farmers. They were, uh, uh, some of them teachers, some of them priests, some of them uh, prophets, some of them fishermen. They all came from backgrounds just like us. And so they had to struggle the same way that we did. All right, They're not like these elitists running around who had standards for everybody, but then didn't bother to try and live up to the standards themselves. Okay, Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to the... Now remember, pretend the chapter break isn't there. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the, un that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will put, in, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be, uh, also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectations of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. And for the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for uh, as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now notice it's the Spirit making the intercession with groanings. It's not the person praying. So this is not a gibberish, uh, or some people like to call it tongues. Uh, the, what many Pentecostals call tongues is not tongues, it's just gibberish. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. For we know that all things work together for good to those who are uh, for good to those who are who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now you got to notice some things. Verse 28 many times is misapplied and misquoted. Uh, it doesn't say all things are going to be good. It doesn't say all things are going to work out. Or good comes from all situations. It says all things work together for good to those who love God. And then you need to read verse 29 for the full context. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Uh, and, and then to those who are the called according to his purpose, for he who, uh, whom he foreknew, he predestined. The whole uh, uh, end game, so to speak, is to make us more like Jesus. And God takes the good and the bad, puts them together, and that's how he accomplishes it. And then verse 31 also a misunderstood and misapplied passage. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. 
and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written? For your sakes we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are all third-party things. Uh, you know, if, if you get home from work or from church and you see your house is burned to the ground, it's just a pile of ash. Well, that's not going to separate you from God. You get sick, you get COVID, you get cancer, you get whatever. That's not going to separate you from God. The only thing that can separate you from God is you. It's free will. God will not force you into heaven if you do not want to be there. And that goes for Christians. Christians can fall away. They can decide to give up their faith. Unfortunately, it's happening more and more. These people that are de what is it deconstructing their faith because in a lot of ways the church is not doing a good job at uh, getting the faith of these kids uh, solidified before they leave home. So we've got to pick up our uh, pick up our game and uh, and do a better job of that. So okay, so let's go to God in prayer to close out. And today we'll pray, boy, does our nation need it now? Uh, we really need to be praying because the administration is trying to basically make it impossible to prohibit Christians from adopting or fostering children if they won't go along with the transgender, uh, the mutilation and castration of children, otherwise known as transgenderism. Uh, and that needs to be stopped. It's a violation of the First Amendment. It's a violation of science. It's a violation of uh, the Hippocratic Oath and to do no harm because this whole thing is doing a lot of harm so let's go to god in prayer and we pray father we thank you father for this day thank you for jesus thank you for all the things that you provide and we want to pray for our nation we want to pray for our administration for our congress for our courts our governors our legislatures and we want to pray lord that righteousness can be restored that a, the standards of your word can be restored and that people will see that they need Jesus, that they need the God of heaven, which is you. We pray for the defeat of, of evil overseas in Israel and, and Gaza. We pray for the defeat of evil here at home with the uh, gender ideology agenda and other things that are tearing the country apart. We pray that you will uh, guide us, Lord, help Christians to be the light that we need to be so that we can win souls for you, that we can uh, turn the nation around and make it the freedom, a uh, bastion of freedom that it has been for these uh, 200 plus years. We thank you for all the things you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have through Jesus, and help us, Lord, to proclaim that. And forgive us of our sins, Lord. Help us to walk with you in Jesus' name. Amen. So leave your questions or your comments in the comment section below. Send me your questions at 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. I will get an answer out as quick as I can. Can't guarantee you'll like my answer. Just be as specific as you can about your question. And I'll, at my discretion, answer it in a sermon or in a, a YouTube short or, or however I think it best to answer it. That's it for today. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great uh, rest of your week. We'll see you in the next video. I'm out.